Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Hello, hello to my loyal subs. I hope you're having a great day. And to anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you so much for checking out my channel. All I ask is that after watching and or listening to the video, if you find you enjoyed it, please smash the like button, consider subscribing, feel free to share, and hit that notification bell. And with all that out of the way, let's dig in dogs. They're said to be man's best friend. But canines trained to search for missing people, either alive or dead, might feel like your worst enemy if you are the guilty party and you're trying to hide a body. One of the most confusing details in the Sebastian Rogers case has to do with canines. What exactly did they hit on? What type of dogs were used? I listened to an almost four hour show on another channel where two canine handlers answered questions related to scent dogs in general and to how they've been used in this investigation. A young woman named Julia Valenti, who also goes by Jules, by the way, is an officer in the U.S. Army and she is trained in all things scent dog, both live scent dogs and cadaver dogs. And another woman named simply Steph, who along with her husband, apparently owns several bloodhounds on the show. Now since I first recorded this video, JS for Justice has come out to say that Steph is indeed a scammer. JS for Justice believes that the Proudfoots and the Bower Sox are likely behind this, that they wanted to undermine the legitimate dog handler, Jules Valenti. Now while Jules Valente's credentials appear to be absolutely 100% legitimate, the other person on the panel, this Steph lady, is apparently a scammer. I don't believe she's a dog handler, and I think everything she said on the show was likely made up. And she was acting weird from the very beginning. She had a very bad connection to the show. She disappeared at times. She would pause, she wouldn't answer questions. She seemed very strange in an all around kind of way. And I do think Julia Valenti began to suspect this as well as this four hour show went on. So what I'm trying to tell you is, you can take what Julia Valenti or Jules Valenti, as I sometimes refer to her, said as fact, and then when I share something that this Steph person said, you can decide if you think it's true or it's false. I really wish people would stop messing with this case and stop muddying the waters. It's like they want it to be another Summer Wells case, a case where there's no conclusion, where the child isn't found, where we don't have answers. Now I'm going to share what I see as the show's key takeaways, but let me do a little intro first. So in their latest questionable move, Chris and Katie Proudfoot have turned down Jules Valenti and this Steph person who both offered to bring their live and cadaver scent dogs to the Proudfoot home and property. Now this Valenti lady spoke to Chris Proudfoot two days after the infamous Web Sleuth show that led to Chris's meltdown on a recorded call with the private investigator, Heather Cohen. So Chris was probably not in the best of moods when he spoke to Jules Valenti. Valenti said she was able to connect with Chris over their shared military experiences and backgrounds. Chris asked her to prove who she was, so Jules sent him her military ID, which is something that she rarely hands out to other people. Well, a week went by, and then Chris contacted her, and he told her that he had turned down her offer of assistance. He did not want her to bring her scent dog to his property, and Valenti, who had jumped through hoops to get all the information to Chris was sad and upset that he turned down her offer ultimately. If he was planning to reject it, he should have just done that in the beginning. Jules also said that her credentials were approved by the TBI, so it made no sense for Chris to reject her help. 
But despite his rejection, Valenti will still be heading to Tennessee to search in other places for Sebastian. She said that she'll need an object belonging to the child, preferably one of his shoes. And because Chris and Katie don't want to cooperate with her, she's going to have to get the shoe from Seth. Now that's not ideal because she would rather get a shoe that was worn more recently by Sebastian. And I believe it had been about a month since Seth had seen Sebastian when Sebastian went missing, so the shoes with the greatest amount of his scent are at the Proudfoot home. By not agreeing to let those dogs in their home or on their property, it does make it seem like Chris and Katie Proudfoot aren't interested in searching for and finding Sebastian. Let me though say that Chris and Katie haven't been charged with any crime, at least so far, and it's possible they truly don't know what happened to Sebastian. But at the same time, when they reject help from people who want to find Sebastian, it's common sense to question why. Why is that? Why don't they want the help? Do they not want Sebastian found? Are they hiding something and do they want to keep it hidden? Steph, the other alleged dog handler, is also planning to go back to Sebastian's neighborhood and she wants to also check other locations in Tennessee. One place that a lot of people want searched is a storage unit near the Warshams General Store. And that's where Chris Proudfoot's mother, Kathy Bowersox, was allegedly seen in the early morning hours of Monday, February 26, before Sebastian was reported missing. Some people have theorized that Sebastian was handed off from Katie Proudfoot to Chris's mother, Kathy, that morning. Chris, of course, went ballistic on web sleuths when somebody brought his mother up and that possible sighting. Jules Valenti said that scent dogs who previously worked on Sebastian's case allegedly hit on the retention pond, a barn, and a dumpster. Hearing that they hit on a dumpster makes it clear why the authorities went to Kentucky to check out a landfill there where that garbage is typically sent to. But frankly, I'm baffled by these canine hits, as well as Katie and Chris saying that they took polygraphs and passed them with flying colors. That's what makes this case so incredibly perplexing. The Proudfoot say they've been cleared, but they don't act the way we expect parents of missing children to behave. I don't care who you are, you know they're not acting like parents with missing children who want to find those children. And by the way, Jules and Steph both said that they've received creepy emails with smiley faces in them. They've also had many phone calls where the callers hang up. It feels like somebody doesn't want them searching for Sebastian in Tennessee. Someone is trying to scare off these people. Why? According to Steph, scent canines have a three-month scent window after somebody goes missing to still be able to pick up the scent. But the weather namely rain, can diminish the scent. I know that Sebastian's been gone for nearly two and a half months, and apparently Hendersonville has received a fair amount of rain in that period, so that could make it difficult for the dogs to pick up Sebastian's scent. Steph's dogs, if she is who she says she is, are bloodhounds and their hits are apparently admissible in court. That's because they are so accurate. Here's an interesting detail that came out during the conversation. Handlers dealing with dogs trained to sniff out illicit substances typically carry Narcan for both the dogs and themselves, just in case they come in contact with the drugs. Steph told a story about her dogs searching on the Proudfoot property, I believe, and they actually hit on something, but right as they were hitting on this scent, Chris Proudfoot got very aggressive with Steph and her husband, and he told them to leave. The dogs were confused because they're trained to pick up on the scent and go for it. They're not trained to pick up a scent and then be told to go away from the scent. I have to say this is a red flag. If this really happened, 
That is a huge red flag. Steph did clarify, however, that her dogs did not hit on blood when they were sniffing for Sebastian, but it sounds like these dogs were not allowed inside the Proudfoot home. And note that according to both Jules and Steph, dogs can detect the scent of death even when it's under concrete. Steph said that when she first saw Katie Proudfoot, Katie's face was red, her eyes were bloodshot, and she looked like she'd been crying for days. The host of the show, Jay is for Justice, then said she thought she saw bruises in Katie's face during one of the interviews. In truth, we have seen some sadness and tears from Katie Proudfoot, which hints at three things. One, she had feelings for her son, Sebastian. Two, if something bad happened to him to lead to his death, maybe it wasn't pre-planned. Maybe it was an accident. And three, because she's not searching, it hints at her knowing that such a search would be futile, and she knows that he is beyond help. And if it's true that he is deceased somewhere out there, she may be fearing the legal ramifications. Nobody wants to go to prison. That's like the worst thing that could happen to you next to death, right? Especially if it means a life sentence or a capital case where somebody could lose their life. That person is not going to fess up unless they find themselves against a wall with nowhere else to turn. And maybe if they're offered a deal, maybe then they might spit out the truth. I heard another woman who was convicted of murder say that you can never really get away from it. Even if you haven't been caught yet, it's always there, it's always with you. The fear of getting busted is always in the back of your mind. But let's remember, Chris and Katie Proudfoot have not been charged with any crime. Anything I talk about here is pure speculation. By the way, if you want to help me and help my channel, one free way you can do it is to go over to Spotify, find me under the name Carnage Street, and leave me a positive review. It's a huge way you can help me. I'd be eternally grateful, and I'll see you next time on Bed Crime Stories.